Okay, welcome back then. It's late November um, 1858, and this is going to be our kind of uh, winter stroke um, autumn report for this year. And uh, let's start off really with kind of foreign policy and have a look at what's happening. Uh, wars are rippling across the continent, and the first thing which is really interesting is that it really looks like the Piedmontese have kind of dropped the ball here. They've sort of snatched you know, uh, <laughs> defeat from the jaws of victory. They had a really, really good kind of, um, a really good deal with the Austrians, really. They managed to get, you know, they managed to come out of the war on top. They seized Milan, which is the biggest, um, the, the biggest city in Italy, and they have all the prestige attached to that. And with that, I think they'd have been in a really good position to begin to develop their position in sort of central Italy. But, um, yeah, I think they miscalculated you know, uh, they sort of felt that, well, actually, let's go the whole hog, let's give the Nets here, let's sort of uh, maybe, you know, score another significant defeat against the Austrians as the basis, I guess, for consolidating the rest of the, the peninsula. And look, it's it, it, it's not looking like it's going very well. The Austrians have secured Genoa, they've retaken Milan, I mean, they, uh, they, they control the regions around Tor uh, Torino and Alessandria, and yeah, and, and they have, they've obviously captured Savoy or Chambray, it's not good. Um, it doesn't mean to say that the, the situation isn't recoverable, but like it looks like... I mean, we were kind of privy to the fact that it looked like, even though the Austrians have been badly, badly hurt in the last war with us, they obviously still had a fairly substantial amount of state revenue, and we could see that they had a, a, undergone a, a, you know, a fairly sizable armaments expansion. That was the impression we got. That said, when we ended the war with them, we hadn't destroyed most of their army at all. They still had a standing army that was about the same size as our army, so they didn't need to expand it that much. Um, but in any case, uh, the Austrians are doing very, very well now. And um, I don't know how sustainable a large army is for Austria with the economic damage that, that it sustained, but we should also remember that Austria has a very, very efficient civil service and bureaucracy, more so than we, and probably also some other kinds of options, you know, which we wouldn't have access to, like uh, decrees and laws, financial instrumentation, and also, of course, they could just... Um, dramatically modify their tax sliders, increase tax, which put pressure on, on things like, you know, uh, population satisfaction, increased revolt risks and so on, but uh, will net them um, a significant increase in terms of sort of state revenue returns, which will allow them to sustain a larger army. But who knows um, how they're doing it, but they certainly have a large enough army to deal a serious blow to Piedmont Sardinia. And uh, best case scenario here, I mean, we'd probably favor an Italian victory, even though we really consider both competitors. Um... You know, we're, we're looking long term to sort of to see Austria really kind of completely humbled, very, very weakened and um, maybe even dismantled. Uh, I don't know. But um, yeah, seeing Italy sort of uh, get the upper hand from this looks like a long odds, but it'd be welcome. Um, but also, you know, what could be really good here is maybe the Italians don't give up. Maybe Austria becomes embroiled in a sort of Vietnam-esque kind of conflict in northern Italy trying to get its own back and uh, Italy doesn't budge on Milan. I don't know. Um, but we'll keep an eye on the situation. The other significant conflict which has broken out, of course, is the Franco-Prussian War. And it's not the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. You know, with every decade you go back from 1870, Russia's slightly weaker and France correspondingly slightly stronger. And, um, well, the initial invasion by Prussia looked quite good. I mean, you can see the remains of it. They had Reims and uh, they, they had the area around Sedan and Lille. Amiens, and, and it looks like they're being kind of gradually rolled back. So their initial kind of opening moves um, haven't come off. It's look, it looks like France is recovering. But yeah, it could be a protracted conflict. I don't know. This is welcome. I mean, to tell you the truth, any significant conflict between any European power is a welcome thing for the Ottoman Empire, as I think as far as we're concerned. And of course, we're going to have favourites probably in this conflict. I'd probably rather see Prussia come out on top. You know, um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but I'd, I'd happily see France defeated, uh, badly defeated, and uh, that would be absolutely welcome. I'd rather that than Prussia defeated, but um, it doesn't matter, really. Whilst these European powers are fighting each other, for the most part, it probably means they're going to keep their nose out of our business, frankly, and it gives us the elbow room, the time, the breathing space to develop our economy, develop our railroads, build our factories, and also, we can benefit economically from this. Look, one thing I've done is uh, let's go to uh, Ministry of Industry and Commerce. So I have deactivated conversion of munitions, um, well, ammunition and, and military supply. The reason for that is because we have ample ammunition sort of supply on on the map. Uh, so we don't need to convert any, anything from our national stockpile to the map. We have we have more than enough 
and what we're going to start doing is exporting military supply and ammunition because you know what it just feels like there's going to be a market for that stuff right now uh there's you know there's wars ripping across the continent and if we can be an arms supplier and and you know and if we can get some private wealth if our capitalists can get some money then absolutely so be it so we, we've got these offered uh, for export it'll take a bit of time before anyone bites you know it's usually the case that you have things you know available for you know for a fairly sort of sustained period of time and eventually a faction will need supplies will need ammunition i mean both france and prussia have a fairly developed um kind of industrial military complex um Aust uh, austria doesn't <laughs> fun enough it did uh, but uh, it was all completely destroyed so um i mean austria will you know there's a good chance austria will have fairly substantial stockpile of ammunition and supply on the map but we'll see what happens with that if they become if the war in northern italy becomes protracted and they can't get pm or suddenly to heal or if it goes the other way you know if if um if austria has some kind of surprise sudden defeat it doesn't look like it's going to happen just now but if that does happen then um you know and it, it becomes a prolonged war then let's turn my phone off um yeah then uh yeah we'll, we'll sort of see what happens you know like uh, it may be the case that we'll have opportunities for um uh, have opportunities for exports for munitions and supplies okay that's pretty much it then in terms of sort of foreign policy stuff uh, apologies there. i was momentarily distracted by my phone but um the, the other sort of conflict is uh, in scandinavia uh, it looks like really the russians are kind of have come out on top here i don't know you know what concessions i mean they must be in a really strong position now they held stockholm for a while but i suppose the longer they hold stockholm um the more they consolidate their position in scandinavia um uh the harsher the terms they can impose on the Swedes, you know. Um, so maybe that's what they're going for. Interesting also, it looks like Russia has gone through a temporary flag change. Um, this is a part of a patch I installed, actually, a kind of bug fix patch, which introduces some dynamic things, you know, like uh, flag changes that happen at different times and so on. So that's quite neat. First time I've ever seen that. Um, yeah, so. But um, that's it. In terms of foreign policy, that's it. I think all we can do is see if we can benefit from, benefit from this by, you know, again, exporting kind of munitions and military supplies and, um, yeah, use that to better, you know, use that to kind of um, advance our own commercial position, I think. Our armed forces, I think, are now well placed to confront any security challenges. They're twice the size of what they were eight years ago and um, we've, you know, qualitatively increased the army substantially also. So we've got our sort of fourth army then established now in Ankara with all the kind of... Um, all the nuts and bolts in place, really. That is a full standing army. Some of the kind of Abdi Pasha. It's uh, ninety thousand, you know, thirteen thousand cavalry, four hundred thirty four guns, and also there are some, you know, there are some command points available to increase that. Uh, probably with only small forces. Probably sort of uh, increasing the commitment of uh, independent artillery regiments to it. Uh, in the east, uh, the second army, um, or I should say the third army under um, Abdul Karim Nadir, is what it always was. Ninety thousand, you know, just under five hundred guns. Second Army under Hussein Avni, and First Army under um, under Omar Pasha, and that's it. And yeah, I mean, basically we have four armies. Each of them are about eighty thousand to a hundred thousand apiece, um, and we, you know, with broadly the same kind of configuration. They've always got um, a guard corps, two infantry corps, one cavalry division or two, some independent artillery regiments, um, and. Um, sort of service asset units, provosts and, and engineers and so on. Now the other development on the colonial front is, well, I had a bit of a kind of soft plan, which I'm not going to go ahead with now. I was kind of thinking on the fly about maybe developing some kind of position um, in Southeast Asia. I'm not going to do this, or we're not going to consider doing this for some time. The reason being is the more I thought about this, we kind of spread fairly thin in terms of the colonial assets that we have and sumatra is an ahistorical thing if we could pull this off it'd be really really good and we are doing really really well but with sumatra the dutch already had a fairly well established position so it was a case of kind of going all in or not at all really and we've kind of gone all in so um yeah i mean like in most of these territories now we've we have a trade post uh we have missions and we're also expanding that to uh, like local bribing operations uh, with local chiefs just you know, developing a, co a colonial penetration and even in jambi uh we have a trade post and a mission and we're going to be looking to construct uh, a military outpost the first of its kind which will give us some military control over jambi we're going to think about doing that also in uh, siak uh, siak is a kind of uh, there's a dutch mission there and the dutch have 
36% colonial penetration. We're only sitting at 2%. But we've got merchants. Once we get to 5%, you know, we can get a trade post in there. We can start looking at kind of bribing, bribing operations of local chiefs. And um, that will raise our colonial penetration. And I think soon enough, we could be in a position to get a trade post here as well. Now, we are going to begin, well, we've, we've already begun the construction of a marine brigade, a small expeditionary force, uh, which is almost completed training. I think we're going to probably add a supply detachment to that. And we're going to move the marine brigade to Basra. And then from Basra, we are going to conduct an expedition, quite a long range one. We'll have to get some transports in the Persian Gulf, from the Persian Gulf, and we're going to try and make land uh, on Acha, or Acha, or Acre, however it's pronounced, the, uh, the most westerly part of the island of Sumatra. And we're going to try and militarily occupy this region. And once we get enough military control over this region, which we can, we can do fairly quickly, I mean, the military force itself may not give us much military control, but once we have military forces there, we can, for example, uh, look at kind of pacification, things like this, that'll increase um, our military control of the region, and then we can establish a colonial fort. And once we actually have enough military control, we can build a harbour, begin constructing some infrastructure, and the basis ready for a, well, this will constitute a full-time, a full, you know, long-term military base, a kind of, um, we'll have a, you know, a harbour, in addition to the colonial fort, we'll probably look to, to kind of construct a more modern European-style fortress, a depot, so on and so forth. And we'll begin to develop that deeper and deeper um, or, or into Sumatra. We're going to basically try and muscle in on Sumatra. Now, the colonial capital, uh, Palembang, uh, the Dutch are very well established there indeed. They've got 55% colonial penetration. This area would have almost been at the point where they could have transferred transfer transform this region into a protectorate um, but I think probably what we've done has done much to atrophy the Dutch colonial position here and the Dutch have got their fingers in a lot of pies so they kind of you know their, their commitments are a little bit spread and they're not really countering this very effectively um, it hasn't triggered any kind of crisis between us it's a it is a contested region but um, it will obviously put pressures on you know pressure on, on relations between us but I quite fancy it I fancy this you know um, I think this is absolutely achievable and so we're going to continue pursuing this um, outside of position in Sumatra. The other thing we are going to do is to look to now raise the penetration um, in the Persian Gulf to just enough to really move these to colonial status. They've been long-term protectorates now, I think, for about five years or more. Uh, we've got colonial merchants going in, in Dubai and Qatar. And that should check the, I mean, I think we need about 50, 55%. Let's have a look for uh, colony status. Formal colony, yeah, so 50%, 50 to 100%. So once we get these to kind of... Um, Dubai is a bit more complicated because it would require us to bring um, Trucial, Trucial uh, up to 40, it's 39. We can do something there as well. But the, this area, it's very, very peaceful. Um, uh, it's it's paid for itself many, many times over through kind of constant access to, to gems. You can see now also that uh, some areas are beginning to be... This is just sort of um, scripted. Areas are being prospected for petroleum. You're beginning to see the beginning of the petroleum age. You know, uh, obviously, this is not going to feature as a really important or significant resource until probably uh, the later period that uh, this game covers. But anyway, uh, we'll have, we have good access to that resource where, we base, where we're based. But yeah, Qatar, Dubai, and Bahrain... Um, He's on the cusp of being a colony, I would say. Not far off at all now. And the other long-term project um, is the Hajez. Um, this is just going to require a constant protracted effort. You know, we've, we've got 55% colonial penetration in Medina, which is the colonial capital. It's a protectorate. What we need, I think, beyond that is average 40% penetration in all other territories. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, like that, that's some way away, to tell you the truth. Um, so it, it's going to be, I think maybe this is achievable probably by 18, 1865. If we can kind of set like a plan for Hedgehairs, 1865 colonial status. This is quite a big region. So when this is raised to colonial status, it will be really noticeable, you know, because it's going to be, I mean, like compared to kind of Western Anatolia, it's going to be fairly sparsely populated. But... Um, there's enough people here that'll be noticeable. It'll be really noticeable in terms of a state revenue. Um, I can imagine the wealth of the accumulated nobility of the Hajjahs would make a noticeable difference. So this would be, we'll notice it when it happens. And then, of course, the long-term project, the kind of running saw, is Yemen. And we continue operations to, to try and pacify this region. 
And again, it's happening very, very gradually, but I think we're going to have to sort of shrug off any ideas of any expansion into the eastern part uh, of the territory, really, until this area is, is properly pacified. We've got a kind of military expedition, um, seven turns from being prosecuted in Sana. That will kind of reduce the, the revolt risk. That is, if any of these forces don't move into Sana. And we're going to have to do that continuously, I think, in lots of different, lot, you know, lots of different sort of the, the tiles that comprise this region. The revolt risk here is just much higher than anywhere else. If you consider the average revolt risk in somewhere like Yemen, you know, it's high enough, but um, it's it's down here really. That, like, it's just a really, really violent place. It's, you know, 3 point sort of 12%. It's just kind of, it has a kind of Mad Max-esque kind of character to it. Um, so yeah, we have to, it's, it's just, it's an ongoing. The thing is, I say, I said in the last video, or the one before, that it won't pay for itself. But, I mean, the raw materials here are really, really good. I mean, opium, with the access to opium that we have here, we've got one, two, three, four, plus the opium we have access to in Western Anatolia, in Bursa. You know, to tell you the truth, this could make us one of the leading opium exporters um, in the world. Uh, once this region is properly consolidated, brought up, you know, through protectorate to colonial status, has railroads and RGOs developed exploiting this, this could be a really, you know, it, it wouldn't actually take that long. Once this is properly consolidated, everything we've poured into it, probably only take a couple of years actually for it to pay for itself, just because of how lucrative these resources are. Also coffee, you know, coffee is definitely not as lucrative as opium, but it's it's good stuff, and we've got three kind of um, three regions. Here that actually, you know, um, that, that kind of have naturally occurring coffee. So that's good. Um, that is pretty much it, to tell you the truth. Exports have dropped off ever so slightly, um, but not in any way that's really, really concerning. I, I mean, I should say, I say it dropped off. It, exports have kind of like the sort of um, agricultural organic kind of exports not tobacco tobacco is, is consistent but fish fruits uh, cereals they've dropped off ever so slightly i think as time goes on we are going to have more and more competition um for you know to, for, for sort of agricultural goods especially as other kind of countries develop especially as countries like latin america begin to gradually develop and kind of enter the world into the you know the global kind of economy also japan i mean japan is a long term it's, oh, it's not japan that's the philippines Japan is still very much a backwater, but won't remain so forever. And Japan, China, as these regions do gradually begin to develop, it will be the agricultural parts of their economy that will develop first, probably. And that will result, you know, likely in a, in a significant decline in um, agricultural exports for us. But maybe not, you know, maybe not. Um, but in any case, it's happening at the moment. But we're seeing kind of an increase in exports of more, you know, at the kind of top end of our economy now. Consistent exports of textiles, dyes, manufactured goods. And one thing I'm really noticing is significantly increased domestic market sales for these things. So, for example, textiles. We bought a massive uh, stockpile of textiles and then began selling them. And then I began noticing that even when we weren't selling them, I wasn't increasing in the number of textiles, so I checked, my, you know, I checked what consumption was. It's just that the, the consumption of textiles is going up. Uh, they've become much more available in our economy. There's more wealth in the economy, so that's good. And that'll also happen with things like manufactured goods and also luxury goods. Um, now, as I already mentioned, we do have railroad in Zondalak, Ankara, which is not visible to us. A line going in um, in Sinop and also Trabzon, and we're going to be looking to expand that create a bridge here we don't want to do batumi the reason being is we don't really want the kind of hinge of this rail line being vulnerable to sort of uh the russians moving in so we're going to create a bridge here into ezrum and then from ezrum to cars and we'll create a branch link off from cars down to van and the purpose for that of course is to uh, exploit um iron uh which there, you know we, we import about 10 units of iron uh, per fortnight a significant amount um, that's going to be the next stage for economic development, really. We have uh, begun an additional textiles factory, for all the reasons I just mentioned. Um, increased demand for textiles, and the fact that there is an export market now, a fairly consistent export market. And we've got an additional luxury goods factory. So Sinop is beginning to really take shape now as a kind of, you know, a meaningful industrial um, city. And, yeah, that's it. Um, the other thing is the Navy, well, the Naval Plan... Um, which was to create an additional uh, raiding fleet, has happened. Uh, we have an additional raiding fleet. I don't know why it does this, but when you load the game up, it kind of gives the fleet strange names. But anyway, under, under Mushavir Pasha, uh, for some strange reason, I can't give him command. 
Oh, there we go. It worked. Okay, fine. Uh, Anu Mushavir Pasha, anyway, is based in Basra. Um, now, one thing I have noticed is that uh, Iraq, I mean, it's a, it's a colony, uh, but, I mean, I think the most southerly, uh, other than Jerusalem, which we expanded the depot in Jerusalem precisely to facilitate our kind of colonial conflict in, in um, Yemen, um, it's, a, it's a different story on, on the kind of Tigris and the Euphrates. We just don't have much in the way of depots here. So we've begun the construction of a depot in Baghdad. We're going to do the same in, in Basra. And we're going to create, we're going to basically encase both of these cities in kind of modern fortresses, not just colonial forts. Firm them up and then use that as the basis then to kind of expand the port in Basra. But we do have a maritime presence now in the Persian Gulf. This force has just arrived. It's going to require a bit of time um, to kind of, um, I think it was about a sort of, 60 70 day kind of journey because of course there is no Suez canal yet that will be built at some point soon enough and will be usable um i guess by the british or the french um but for the time being everything has to sail around the horn of africa so it's a pretty long journey but they're there um the yeah the crews are enjoying some crew leave and they're kind of getting settled in for what is going to be a permanent deployment at some point we might construct a base elsewhere but there's no there's nothing wrong with basra it's a pretty good location actually and once this force is recovered, it will initially conduct anti-piracy patrols, and obviously will, uh, you know, will have. There could be other opportunities in the event of a, of a conflict with a major power. That's it. I don't think there's anything else to report on. The army, the army reform plan, which we had a bolt on to increase the army by basically a quarter, a double, you know, doubling the army in total from 1850, is now complete. Uh, the naval plan is more or less complete. We are going to build an, an additional um, squadron of um, screw corvettes. We're not going to do that just yet. One of the reasons being is I, I kind of noticed that relations were taking a bit of a hit. And I thought a lot of that is going to be on the basis of a significant military expansion. Other powers, this, this is before the time where powers necessarily concealed their military you know, expansion very much. And even actually they might even wear it on their sleeve to make a bit of a point. Um, so it's something that is observed. It's something that's conducted fairly out in the open, and you know, very few measures were taken to kind of conceal armaments or anything like that. So um, it, you know, everyone's seeing that we're doing this, and obviously they're going to be drawing conclusions from that. That may have been the reason why the Austrians, even though they just come off come out of a war with us, you know, took the the, the measure of kind of um, developing significant presence around Bosnia. Uh, that was a little bit concerning, but. Right, that's it. The next video will be in, what are we, late November 58. Between March, or well, between January and March, I'll see what happens. I won't sort of create videos for the sake of it. It's worth kind of updating, you know, updating on sort of developments, um, economic developments and our kind of various colonial projects. Uh, but I won't just create a video for the sake of it. So I'll see what happens. If, um, yeah, if there's much worth reporting on in January, uh, January or February 59, then I will. If not, I will leave it to kind of March or April and conduct a kind of spring report um, then. So, yeah, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.